right. Well, uh, we are back here again on a Thursday for Thinking Length Paths Optional, uh, where we leave it up to you. And uh, we get to have a wonderful conversation uh, with Christian and Ted uh, today. This is going to be absolutely amazing. Um, but before we give in, give into that and dive deep into this um, interesting uh, hour of discussion, we uh, want to make sure we give a little bit of honor to our two sponsors. Um, first one being chocolate, Verse Chocolate, which we absolutely love. Sponsor mainly because they pay us to eat chocolate um, and consume a lot of chocolate and distribute it and, and all kinds of other stuff. Um, uh, and, uh, and then it's amazing. So we did this a long ago to help connect and inspire people moving to this digital pants optional format um, has expanded our reach of uh, people to today. So uh, I'm going to hand it off to Ted and Christian to introduce themselves and then hand it back to Kelly to ask our first question of these two. So Ted, you want to take it away with a little bit of background on you and how you got to this moment in time on this show, Thinking Like Pants Optional. Um, okay, cool. Actually, I'm going to call an audible and I'm going to introduce Christian Bush if I can. Ah. Um, and, uh, Please. so, that's great. um, cause that's, you know, he's the star here. So Christian and I, uh, met when both of our, when Christian's wife invited my wife to join them all in their play group, uh, when all of our kids were like three and four. So Christian and I have known each other for 15, 16 years. Christian was very nice because I would come to play group every once in a while and he would wonder what I was doing there. Um, and I was like, juice box and a nap in the afternoon, dude, why am I not here? Um, and so ever since then, uh, we've known each other. And of course, obviously, because you all have Google, um, Christian is an amazing talent, wins Grammys, on the cover of all the magazines, makes everybody feel happy. And he's just one of the great uh, American singer-songwriters uh, working today. So I'm just super thrilled that uh, you, Kelly, and you, Aaron, asked uh, Christian to be along and then you were willing to have me. So ladies and gentlemen, Christian Bush. Oh my uh, God, does this uh, mean I get to introduce Ted? <laughs> if you'd like, Christian, you, you can certainly do it. I can only do a small amount, but um, <laughs> he was the one guy that I kept looking at in uh, play group and going, I wonder what he does for a living. And then I thought I, when I when I was asking the other moms, because what other husbands were at playgroup? Like I was the only other guy. <laughs> and it's because I have a rock and roll job, which means I don't start working until four. Um, and and they'll just kind of let me get away with my pajamas till 3.30. And that's been my whole life. And uh, I, I kept, you know, trying to figure out what Ted did. And somebody said, just like rumors have it, that maybe – he sells handbags, you know, that are hot. Um, maybe he is a, a drug dealer. We, we didn't know, but he always was well-dressed. And then he told us he was into marketing and we were like, oh, mm. as, as if it wasn't weird enough to tell a group of people that you're a recording artist. <laughs> uh, but what I found out very quickly is that Ted and I were both chasing the exact same thing, which is, um, you know, uh, sharing things with people makes us feel better. And then we surrounded that with a job. <laughs> so he went that way and I went into music. <laughs> There's also, he's extremely successful and owns Fizz and talks to people around the world and writes books and stuff. But, you know, basically that's who he is. That was great, Christian. Ted, would you say... Beautifully done. Yeah. Thank you. Well done. Always as always. Consummate performance. Thank you, Christian. You're very calm. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, thank you again. Thank you both for being here. I understand Aaron and I had a couple of glitch, technical glitches there in the beginning of our introduction. Hopefully we're loud and clear now, um, but we're ready to dive in. Ted, Christian, again, excited to have you both here. Um, I have no doubt this is going to be an entertaining conversation, um, and, uh, but I want to start with just a couple of quick questions to get, to get us started. First of all, Ted, and I know this applies to Sugarland and, and, and Christian in terms of the marketing of, but let's talk a little bit about word of mouth marketing. 
Okay. Give me your definition of and how you've applied that to how you've worked with Sugar Land and Christian, how you've applied that in your own, in the music industry. So Ted, you wanna start? So word of mouth is people talking to each other. Uh, and that's obviously happened for thousands of years. Um, a few thousand years ago, uh, people started to organize that conversation. So the extra M in word of mouth marketing basically stands for organization, for taking those people that you think are gonna love your stuff and making sure that they know everything about it that you know. And then those people, 10% of all those people who know about that will share that at such a rate that eventually you get what Malcolm Gladwell referred to as the tipping point. So word of mouth marketing is organizing conversation between two people who know each other and helping it to scale and to use other people's joy in sharing stories with each other in a way that is profitable for you as well as them. Right. Ta-da. Great. Great way uh, to like Christian. Yeah, so the music business is the like uh, most obvious answer to, or example or case study of this, right? So no one on earth has ever, ever closed their eyes, opened up a newspaper, turned to the I'm going to buy tickets to this show section and just dropped their finger and said, I'm going to go to this one. Mm -hmm. You are either one of two people. You are the person that is obsessed with this band and you have with some sort of surgical precision decided which friend you're going to ask to go with you mm -hmm. or you are down in the dumps or distracted or too tired and your friend has come to you and is going to drag you to a show. Which means by design, they have already predicted that you're not going to ruin their time. Right. Right. They are going to you. This is a person that's going to love this show, even though you don't even know it. And once you come out and you're a fan too, then we're going to be even better friends than we are when we went in. So right. therefore, when I do this crazy thing, even in arenas, I still do it. Hey, everybody, raise your hand if this is your first time at a Sugarland show. And when you see how many hands go up, your mind explodes, even from the stage. And suddenly, Jennifer and I are now looking at like, out of a 20,000 seat arena, 7,000 people, and now we're obsessed with winning those 7,000. Like, I'll just start pointing at them and figure out what their name is. Like, I, like. I want them to be part of the game, right? That is the most like clear version of word of mouth marketing. Mm -hmm. And and when Ted and I would have these conversations, I, we never disagreed on anything. And then I got fascinated that he had applied a structure or a science to it other than I need a better song or I need a better t-shirt, right? And um so when you start to look through those lenses of a lot of the, the, the experience that he's had doing this with actual products, and we start to treat our, our relationship with our fan differently. Mm -hmm. Suddenly we, you, you know, one fan becomes not two fans because one, they're going to bite somebody that's definitely going to turn into a vampire for us. Mm -hmm. And then those people are now, you know, exponentially biting as long as you feed them, mm -hmm. you know, it's such a weird metaphor. I didn't mean to do that, but, uh, <laughs> I, I like it. I, I, we've never done the vampiric thing before. I think that's awesome because we, well, because, you know, Christian's right. You know, one of the things Christian and I always joke about is you've seen the word of mouth marketing guy um in every vampire and every virus movie there's ever been he's the guy who stands in front of the president and says okay this is day one this is day three and by day 17 it's all over the world right and so and what's really interesting about musicians is there's three and for all of you who work with brands you know you're always looking for models to choose from so when you think about word of mouth marketing, the three groups of people that never walked away from word of mouth were musicians, preachers, and politicians. Because to a man, to a woman, they all start their careers with nothing, with no money, no fans, even John Lennon's kid 
Like, I mean, you might go and buy the first album from Sean, but you don't buy the third one because his dad was John Lennon. You buy the third one because you love his music, so you've got to build. And when you show up with no money, the only way you can do build is Doug Busk has, loves Christian's band, and then Christian and Doug says to all his friends who love music, oh my God, you should do this. And then he tells two people and so on and so on, and you get you know, geometric growth. And that's totally what you saw with Sugarland in the early days. I mean, they used to do all kinds of crazy cool stunts. Um, like they would hide tickets in, in Walmarts. And the first time, Wal and then they would shoot a video of them going and hiding it. And they would just release that video out into YouTube. And like, uh, you know, just to tell a story, like the third time Walmart saw this happen, they were like, oh, you know, you're messing with this. By the eighth time they did that, Walmart's calling them saying, oh my God, we've got a thousand people in the parking lot or whatever the number is. Who are you? And eventually that turns into a relationship where they're doing custom work with Walmart and they're releasing albums throughout the whole thing. And they tell two friends and so on and so on. And they, of course, for those of you who are working with brands, you know, you don't pay advocates. In fact, if somebody wants to walk up to you and say, hello, I'm an influencer and you should pay me, uh, they're lying liars from Liastan. They are broadcasters who want to get paid to introduce their audience to you, and there's nothing wrong with that. But they are not influencers. They are not advocates. They are shills who are looking to get paid for a service. Advocates, like the half of the people who brought the other half of the people to the Sugarland show, Sugarland's not paying them they know that their friend is going to love the Sugarland show and they're sort of OMGing that person and saying, oh, you have to try this. You have to try this thing. Mm -hmm. Whether it's Sugarland or a swell bottle or whatever it is, that's how brands grow the most efficiently in North America today. Ted, thanks for preaching. In fact, someone said Mark just called you the preacher. Preacher word of yes. mouth. So. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Probably the other word of mouth too, religions, right? Preachers for sure. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. You um passion is a word that we've talked about a lot, and people's passions. And the fact that yours, uh, Ted, you have some interesting passions and some interesting components in your background that I wanted to make sure we talk about, especially about folk art, because I found that to be a really fascinating part of a conversation you had previously together um, about your collection of folk art. Beyond the fact that you have this collection of, of tags behind you of, of, uh, from speeches you've been at, which could also be part of our conversation, but I want to hear the folk art story about how you collect folk art, your particular type of folk art that you collect, because people's passions obviously drives that word of mouth, someone that's crazy about something um and talks about it with a bunch of other people because they can't help but talk about it i want to make sure we get a moment to talk about that particular thing i'm i'm glad to um so art that excites me whether it's music or it's painting or it's plays or it's movies is something that is so clearly created because if the artist doesn't do it their head is going to explode i mean they're going to feel physically ill and so one of the interesting things about street art for me, as well as folk art, is you have these people that had zero commercial reason to be doing this. And yet they go and they make all this art and they put it in their front yard, or you're a, you're a street artist and you're literally painting illegally most of the time on the side of somebody else's building. And that art could go away in a day, it could go away in a month, and yet you are compelled to do that. And if you don't do that, you feel sick. You're like, I can't, I have to get this out of me. And so um, I fell in love with the folk art, um, Back when I was a, there was a famous folk artist who lived in North Georgia named Howard Fenster. And I met the Reverend Fenster. We were, I was literally a Boy Scout and we were coming back from summer camp and somebody got a call and said, we needed to go do a good deed for this guy. And he went to a place called, that he now calls uh, Paradise Gardens. And we dug all these weeds out of an irrigation ditch. And he had all this art 
And so that was my first exposure. And then a band I also love did some work with him and another band I love did some other work with him. And then so I have collected over time and my interest in art is just truly and only because I'm like, oh my gosh, that's so great. And then, and then there's just beautiful expressions. I mean, some of this stuff gets a little repetitive sometimes, especially when some folk artists get famous, they keep doing the same thing over and over again. Uh, but when, you know, B.F. Perkins does a painting in the 90s about his turkey that he loved named General Lee, he just, I was like, I must have that because that is insane that you would do that only if you just loved painting and you love, or you love that turkey. And if you're going to love it that much, then I want that to be a part of that my life because that inspires me. Mm -hmm. So that is, yes. uh, that is Ted's joy of folk art and street art. Yeah. You also mentioned the, well, and I don't know that we need to get there, but I thought that was really fascinating how you, um, you buy street art off of people on the streets and your technique for doing that, which I thought was a very elegant um, answer to the question, do you, you're not giving money to people that ask for money on the street, you're buying something. Yes. Right? You're, you're buying something of significant value to you, which kind of questions, and, and in many cases we've done this, where we question what is art, right? And in, in that case, you find that to be art. Um, can you just give a little bit of background for people to know what, we're, what I'm talking about there? Right. So everybody, what Aaron's talking about is I have a fairly extensive collection of signs that people hold up when they're busking or asking for money. Um, and I love those. Now, I don't buy everyone, but if you're going to take the time to make it and make it artful and really do some work with it, I, I will buy them. And it first started years ago. I was in San Francisco and I was coming back from some work in Asia and I always stop in San Francisco for the night and then fly on back to the East Coast the next day. And I was having a tough time sleeping and so I'm walking by and I go to the CVS and, you know, get some stuff and I'm walking back out and somebody says, you know, uh, can I, you know, can I get five bucks from you? And I said, no, I don't have any money. And I walked off and I was like, well, I do have money. It's kind of a jerk thing to do. And then I turned around and I saw their sign and actually, I, this actually hangs out in my office. So, now, I didn't know you were going to ask this, but this is the sign. My wife has been kidnapped, and I'm short 98 cents for ransom. And I'm like, that is so good. Dude, that is so awesome. And I mean, if you were here, you could look at it, and you, you see it's how it's darker right here. So literally, used to hold it here. And so I turned, and I said, uh, I'll give you 10 bucks for it and he couldn't have moved faster. And so, of course, as I'm walking back, you know, it's San Francisco, so I'm walking back, I have it under my hand, and so I'm, I'm at a light, and somebody turns to me and says, hey man, did you, have a, did, you, did you do well today? And hands me two bucks. And I looked at him, I was like, what are you doing? He's like, oh, the sign or whatever. I said, oh no, no, I just bought it from this guy. So now, well, back when you also be able to travel, I, I'm probably on the road 100, 120 days a year, I always bring $10 and two Sharpies and I wrap the 10 bucks around the two Sharpies uh, and that's what I, and that's what I give. And if, and because people who uh, do this for a living and, or this is what they're doing, um, they can always find something to write on, but they always can't some, find something to write with. So now everybody in Fizz, um, you just have a pile of these in your office and they're already done and people take them. And so over the years, we have gotten a crazy collection of signs. Um, and we do it to celebrate people um, and what it is that they're trying to do. I love that. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Um, that's the kind of thing you want to have get around for people, other people to do that, right? To like say, I'm going to, it would increase the level of the art as well as the, you know, people would actually get something from that. That's just, that's elegant. It's beautiful. That's true. Thanks yeah. for asking, Christian, Mike. Yeah. Yes, Christian, Mike. My, my question for you is the um, as an as an artist, uh, you know, there's the artist who paints and puts something on a piece of paper or on a on a canvas, creates it and then puts it on a wall or puts it in front of an audience. But you actually create and then you put yourself in front of that audience, which is, if you really think about it, it's got to be the most pain in the ass kind of thing to do, 
where I go up in front of all these people and perform and have to, <laughs> right, um, and to live this. Um, and so you have to have a tremendous amount of passion to do what you do, which is beautiful. But what, what's driving you right now? What are your passions? What are your interests? Um, I saw the podcast, obviously the music, but people want to know, you know, when it comes to an artist, what are you doing? What's passionate for you? What's interesting for you right now? I, that's a good, that's, uh, it's a good ask and everybody's got their answer. Um, and, and after being locked up for eight months, I can tell you that that's just a little bit like spinning the wheel of fortune to see where the clicker lands. Uh, but there's such a sm low barrier to entry to making, um, art enter the commercial space anymore. There, there used to be, I mean, I, I, you could even like write stuff and put it on Facebook and people think that it's been edited, you know, <laughs> like people think it's actually news and it's like your opinion, right? And just because it, it, it appears printed in the same way that something else that's news is a, appears printed. We're almost to the point where I think you could do your own news broadcast from your house now that we all know how to change the stuff behind us and I need a better camera with depth focus. And if I could just get a lavalier mic to put on, maybe I, you know, and now everybody's Rachel Maddow. And uh, so th the distance between I want to make something and I want it to be commercial, which has always been this weird Venn diagram for me. I've been the one kid that somehow made it into a major label and no one has ever asked me to change my art. And that's weird. And I'm telling you it's weird because every single person around me since 1992 has warned me that they're about to shake me and my hand in front and then slip me back all this other stuff that they need me to do. <laughs> like, man, that's great. You sound awesome. You're great. Can this guy play guitar instead of you? Because he's better. And can you just smile a little more? And we're going to get you. Can you do some sit-ups? Because I think you're a really great artist, but if you did some sit-ups, you know, um, the, the, we love your song. Can you sing this one instead? Like, those are real tropes. Because okay. you're dealing with uh, what you guys deal with, right? You're, you're, how do you sell something to a lot of people? Mm -hmm. You have to know what your product is. And you, it has to be well designed it has to be well thought out it has to have a great story it has to have marketers like ted it has to have all these things for it to hit the sweet spot but as an artist <laughs> you're kind of um one of a bazillion flavors right it's like baskin robbins with exponents on it and you're just looking for the people who like your flavor hmm. but once they do you cannot change your flavor, right? They, they're coming to you because you know how to write a song to break their heart. And the next time they come to you with the, you come to them with a dance song, they're like, dude, it didn't break my heart. I'm going to go find someone else to break my heart. Mm. Right? Oh, so, so you have to, you, as an artist, the, the challenge is how do you constantly continue without selling the same toothpaste, right? Mm -hmm. Because nobody really wants that. We act like we want it. We act like it's comforting, but you don't want that from your artist. Mm -hmm. But the moment you too makes the record you hate, you're out. You're like, man, I'm, I, I want the old U2 record back. And now you're an old person. And now you're on Facebook. <laughs> now, now you don't get to be on the new thing. Because, do you know what I mean? So as an artist, the barrier to entry right now is so small. I can, I did this weird thing where I sat in my home over pandemic and I was like, well, I can't go anywhere. Can't do anything. Um, I, you know, I, I, we can mail hard drives back and forth. We can do different, we can make stuff. What can I do with my phone? I'm bored. And I made a video and they played it on CMT from my phone. Mm -hmm. I use like shutter stock. I know I broke the law like seven ways. <laughs> right. But so what, you know, tell me to take it down, but it felt really good to make that. 
and it made me cry and it made somebody else cry. Mm -hmm. So that's where the inspiration is right now for me is the impossible. Like I just figured out you could make a 24 seven video stream on YouTube. I just figured it out. And the more I went down the rabbit hole of how are you doing? What, how do you, how do you do this? You literally get one computer to scream at another computer for 24 hours at a time. Mm -hmm. And the one that it's streaming to thinks that it's a human. Right? Mm -hmm. So essentially, I just started MTV over in 1980, over the break. And if you'd like to tune in, you can just go to any of my YouTube pages or Facebook pages that have anything to do with any of my bands, except Sugarland. We haven't done that on that one yet. And I'm just going to play music forever until someone tells me to stop and now i get to make up like little trippy video things that go with it because why not i it's yeah. uh, we had our year in meetings yesterday here in nashville for the music business and by the way god bless all y'all but i'm so glad you're not in the music business because everyone here is not only dying and dead and our pants are burned off but it's not going to come back like we're, we're screwed <laughs> and nobody knows what to do about it because we're going to be the last people back in. Right. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, once yeah. we're all back shopping and doing everything, we still are not going to really go to a show with 90,000 other drunk people, mm -hmm. you know, and <laughs> it, that's a lot, you know? Yeah. So watching people adjust to all this is magical <laughs> mm -hmm. because suddenly they're coming to me and saying, look, man, it's time to make great art. <laughs> wow. Really? Yeah. So yeah. I, I think your question is, 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 is a beautiful one. What's inspiring you? The upside down cake of it doesn't matter who wins the Super Bowl this year is an inspiration. The upside down cake that I don't really care who wins a Grammy. The upside down cake of there have been 40 number one songs in country music, and I can't tell you any of them. Mm. I haven't been in my car driving around listening to them. And I don't know, there's somebody that has a huge career. I don't know anything about. Mm -hmm. wow. And suddenly I'm old and I'm on Facebook. And now suddenly I'm not going to have all the new technology and they're leaving me out of the stream. Right. But I'm making something cool and some new kid, which is really what's happened on the internet who are gamers are like, this is the only other 24 seven live thing we've got going right now, man. And now I got, 18 year old gamers from Paraguay really into my music. Mm -hmm. huh. So that's what's inspiring me is that the upside down cake means from a creative standpoint, you can't make a mistake. No one's going to come to you and say, sorry, dude, you tanked your career. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Wow. You've gone global. You just found, I mean, you find new audiences, they show up, you're just doing the art and yeah. people want to show up. They can. If, if Ted walks by and buys your sign, then he buys your sign, yeah. you know, and, and, and we're back to that now. It's mm -hmm. as random as walking down the street. Yeah. So and just from, from a, yeah. from a structural yeah. perspective, what you see here is Christian, really really leaning in and living one of the rules of word of mouth marketing which is your job is to share and not to sell yeah and you want to do it in a way that doesn't interrupt or intercept so christian doesn't know that there's paraguayan gamers that want to listen to his band dark water while they're playing mech warrior or whatever it is they're doing but now all of a sudden there are, and that Mech Warrior community is 800,000 people that are at any one time on planet Earth are all connected to each other, and they will eventually talk to each other, and they will trust each other, because you play Mech Warrior, I'm playing Mech Warrior, so I know this about you, and if this thing is cool to you, then maybe I'll go check it out. Mm -hmm. And maybe eventually, and so they tell two friends, and so on, and so on. And to Christian's point, and I would just say this to everybody who's working with brands, I see some friends of mine on here that you're definitely working with brands. Now is the time to try stuff. 
I 100% agree. I have a friend of mine on here right now. She owns an ice cream company. Uh, she did not do a lot of direct to consumer pre COVID. Her direct consumer is doing so well that she's able to actually go buy another manufacturing facility in a completely different part of the country and sell from there because it's going to be cheaper to ship than instead of all out of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Right? So if you're a brand, I would 100% agree with Christian is you can't do, there's a couple things you can do wrong, but you'd have to be a real jerk about it. So other than the super jerkiest stuff, you can't do anything wrong right this second because everybody is like, I don't know what's going to happen is Christian says we're all dead and our pants have been burned off. So in that situation, if there's nothing wrong, try something because it's a whole nother different Other people. Yes, it's an opportunity. Our musical fans, maybe the new ways. And and uh, Ted Christian saw the podcast. Um, it was obviously regarding word of mouth marketing and the mechanics of a market. We talked about the triangular model of inside story activations. I would love, because I'm, I'm assuming may, maybe many on this call today haven't seen that podcast or heard that podcast, would love, love to dig into that a little bit about story. The authenticity and how you're sharing that. I love your a little bit. So can, can, we, can we dive into those three components? To go, you want to you want to drive me back and forth? Um, we can. All right. So Kelly, so kick us off. Kick us off. Tell us your question. So let's yes, talk, let's do this. Let's talk about starting with the those three prongs or that triangle of insight, story. You know, not selling, and then the activation. Let's start with insight. The why. So have an insight. Why all right. Are we, who are so we? when you're thinking about the why, you really want to think about what is the story that one consumer is going to share with another. Mm -hmm. And for you all, you know, if you like acronyms, write down the word AIR, A-I-R, because all stories that are most likely to be shared between two people who live in North America have three components. They are authentic, they are interesting, and they are relevant, right? So if you're authentic, interesting, and relevant, then you will most likely be shared and then what you want to do is that 10% of the population that's an advocate that shares at a rate, you know, an average, average advocate in the United States, their story will get shared 40,000 times within a year. The other 90% of us, our stories are get shared on average six times. So those advocates are out there because they like to try new things and they love to share stories with their friends. And we've already talked about they're intrinsically motivated. So, one of the things early on that Sugarland used to do back when they were very young in, and very new is they used to send pizzas to the people that were waiting in line to get autographs, like after the show. And Christian would have somebody write a note that says, y'all are cold and hungry, uh, we are too, we'll see y'all in like 30 minutes. And then the story became Oh my God, you know, they're empathetic about us. They get us. And in country, and Christian can talk about this, in country music, you know, all artists are expected to be uh, somehow approachable. And that is different than rap. And that is different than rock and roll. And Christian can kind of take you through all three of those. So when you think about what it is, you, what is the story you're trying to be? And then you figure out a way to share that. So when, it, when you're talking about story, we're talking about that first thing about insight right? Insights are data that you then take. So we think all insights start with math and end with art. So, and Christian definitely do that. Like, who are our people? What's going on? What is our percentage population? Next question, what do they really care about? Third question, what can we do as a brand, as a band, in order to say, we get you, we understand you, here's this thing, and then we'll do this other thing together. And then the more relevant that is, the more interesting it is, the more somebody is going to share that. So that's the, that's the mechanics on how that works. 
And then Sugarland was great, and Christian's other bands that he's been able to apply this to, they take that, and then Christian can talk about this, they take that idea and they run with that. And then they let the marketplace and their, and their fans tell them what is most interesting and most relevant to them. And they then do, do that more. Yeah. yeah your, your best research that you got, and, and with a band, it's real easy because, you know, you have two t-shirts for sale and only one sells, right? Uh, or you have 10 songs on an album and uh, they may tell you on Spotify or something that everyone listens to this one song, but you show up and play and everyone sings the other song. So you just can't, like, I don't have a middle management person lying to me about what they would like me to believe about my success. Hmm. And at the end of the day, I play a song and you, I watched how many people went to the bathroom. I was like, okay, well, you know, I get almost to the point where I even say it out loud. This is a new one. You don't know this. Don't look at me like it's your favorite song. Don't be like, oh my God, because you're lying. Yeah, this is, you don't know this song. If you want to go to the restroom, go to the song. But if you're a big fan, you might enjoy this because this might end up on the next record. And then, then you're playing with the idea, right? You're watching it go back and forth. But because you have this direct connection with these people, even the internet doesn't tell you the truth with it. Um, Sugarland was, uh, <laughs> you'll love this. This is a really funny reality. We were so, um, at the, when we signed our record deal with Mercury Nashville, it was in 2003. And at the time I had come from rock and roll. I had been on Atlantic records out of New York and the, the distance, you know, we always joke about country music and it's not this way anymore, but at the time the joke was pretty, pretty real. We called it the Canada of the music business. It was like seven years behind and nicer. And, uh, everybody there just was just so much more kind, but they also didn't believe me when I told them about iTunes. They were like, yeah, that's not, no, we have distributors. We manufacture things. We make literally $8 per sale as profit. So, uh, and we're selling you a $10 record. Like we are making real money. Why would we bother with iTunes? And I was a geek. I was like, Oh, I love computers and blah, blah. And, this is so much fun. Can you at least put us up there? They're like, sure. And the reason I'm telling you this story is they were so lackluster about this idea that in the studio, you know, every time we do a, a mix of the song, um, you had to document that it's a new version, right? You're just like second version, vocal up, and it's in parentheses, right? And the, the, you, working on computers was relatively new as mixing engineers at that time. And if you go look at Baby Girl on iTunes right now by Sugarland, there's a parentheses next to it that says like second remix, blah, blah, blah. The parentheses never got taken out of the metadata because they didn't believe that it would actually sell. Wow. <laughs> and it is the longest charting country song in that decade. Mm -hmm. And now I live with this metadata Say it, say it, say Fuck it. Fuck <laughs> I want to go like take an intern and I want to like shove their face in and say, always, always do the right thing with your data. Because my kids are gonna inherit a question. Dad, where's the first remix and the second remix? Yeah. And the, I don't know. But it's followed me everywhere that technology that you're working on that you don't think anything of right now because nobody does it mm. is actually, you don't know. So my point is this, uh, my, our fans don't bother us about that, but the song itself became something hugely revealing to us. Mm -hmm. um, it, besides being kind of the story of the band, it was just a wish. It was uh, all it was was like, I, I wish I could pay my parents back for all the money that we borrowed to go chase this crazy dream. Right. And in my case, it was a musician. And it was at the time kind of what we were feeling together because it was the only story we had in common as artists. 
Jennifer, the singer in Sugarland, was an opening act for my old band, Billy Pilgrim. So this was a repositioning. I had decided that I, you know, whatever the metaphor, I still love to wear tennis shoes. I just got to change different place that I'm wearing my tennis shoes. And I need uh, someone else to sing while I'm wearing the tennis shoes. Like it was, I wanted to be a musician. I just was continuously turning it till it fit. Mm -hmm. And um, we realized in country music, there's a, um, <laughs> this is a funny metaphor too. It's a petting zoo is the way we talk about it. There's a lot of petting zoo in country music. And the same in NASCAR, you'll see, there's a lot of access to the artist, mm -hmm. right? there, And not only that, it's expected of you by the people within the business, not just the fans. So mm -hmm. if, if I don't have a meet and greet that, that sees all 100 fans, the mm -hmm. radio programmer is standing there because those are his listeners. And by every fan that I get to meet, he is just taking another read on, man, is this for real? Is Christian really a nice guy or is he putting it on? What's happening? Mm -hmm. But then at the very end, when it's, you know, the mega, like Taylor Swift used to do this. She used to sit after a show for until the very last person left. Mm -hmm. And it's mainly because she was 12. <laughs> and, you know, it, she could do that. And when you're 40, you don't do that as often. But it, it, country music is a high contact sport. And yeah. what's wonderful about it is if you really do feel connected to these fans, it, it's overwhelming as an artist because you've been told no for so many years that a yes is very difficult for you to actually hear. Mm -hmm. So it, you sometimes have to amplify it hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times of somebody saying yes to you for you to even believe yourself. Um, mm. and so those, those meet and greets really do have a huge value. You start to not depend on them or feed on them, but they, they, they calm your nerve mm. that you're, 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 that nobody's telling you the truth, you're messing up or whatever. But what we realized is the people in the meet and greet for this one song, cause you didn't, you never know, a, you, you don't turn on the radio and go, oh my gosh, that's my favorite band. You turn on the radio and go, oh my gosh, that's my favorite song. You don't know the band. And before you knew the band, you didn't care about the band. You just cared about the song. So never forget that. <laughs> so these people were coming to see Sugar Land. They'd heard one song. They, they didn't even know there were three people in the band at the time. They just, well, it's a girl that was singing. Is that the girl? You know, but we would meet them and it would be moms with their daughters or dads with their daughters and their parents. And they would be standing in line together. And I was like, wait, what? And I thought I was a super cool, like, I love the clash. I'll, I'll curse in a record. That was all sorts of other things that were, that was me before coming into country music. But this song was so true to, I wish I could pay my parents back for the money I, I borrowed. That it was ringing the bell between the mom and the child that hadn't even asked yet and her own parent who she'd already asked for money at some point in her life. So we, we had hit a little bit of an archetype, which is a very odd moment in music, but you can see it when you look at the data, which songs are ringing the archetype bells, right? They're just impossible to write authentically because you can kind of see through it when they don't. It's like a, I, I don't mean to offend anybody. It was like all black eyed peas songs. Just like those things aren't real. They're just, they're just like going to Joseph Campbell and like closing their eyes and picking a thing going, let's write about that. And, um, and it's very effective and it is commercially unbelievably good toothpaste. But um, we realized at that moment that the comments that were coming from our fans were, man, I love listening to your record. I can listen to it in the car with my kids. Mm. And immediately we, we have this odd part. And I said, or mentioned earlier in our conversation of my career where people have not asked us to sing certain songs. We write them all. Mm. And I, I became aware of this idea and I, 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 I jokingly named it. <laughs> you mentioned it earlier, like front seat, back seat, like, mm -hmm. 
we were suddenly like the Pixar of country music. Like we could make sexual innuendos that people in the front seat would get. And the kids in the car seat would just sing along. Right. We had this single name called all I want to do. Right. And all it said was all I want to do. It was just like, I mean, I got Marvin Gaye on the wall behind me. You know, it's like, I want to have sex. But you didn't ever have to say it. Mm-hmm. And the people in the front seat were like, whoo, baby. And then the parent, the kids in the back seat were like, just singing. And we realized that somehow we were connecting and it's a harder song to write because it's like, you know, I'd have written a shorter letter if I had the time. It's almost like Tom Petty songs. Like you've got to keep subtracting the song down and down and down and down and taking all of the, the overtness and cleverly kind of prop it up. And country music actually has been a long time, you know, endorsee of this. Mm-hmm. Um, you remember the old song D I V O R C E, right? Right. I'm not going to say it. I'm going to spell it, you know, uh, uh, true. So uh, there, there was a, so, nobody, hmm. nobody kicked us off the radio because we were choosing this land lane, but it definitely like we were the kids in high school that they, we weren't the super popular kid in high school. We were the kind of the outlier in country music that came in and made a difference in a certain particular way because we didn't live in Nashville. We were from mm-hmm. Atlanta. Mm-hmm. But what we realized is this front seat, back seat thing had a value we didn't even calculate. So we started to come up with a moral structure for Sugarland. When is the female in Sugarland going to have sex? Are we going to talk about it? If she ever got into a, 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 a love triangle, that was another big famous song we had, right? Will we talk about it? And what would we say if we did? And who's harmed in the story, you know? Uh, And we became, because we're the songwriters, we're very aware of how we present females. Because we have a a strong female writer, but you're also listening to pretty much retooled songs about a male. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And... And as we started to get further and further into the Sugarland, like what is Sugarland as a brand, we tried to reflect that. And this was really an inspiration of, uh, of Ted, but we, we found out we were doing it after we realized we were doing it, which is the band's never on the cover of the album ever. Cause it's not about us. It's about you. And the album, the, the name of the band, you know, like Van Halen's like this, blah, you Van Halen, right? Sugarland had a thing, how we were, how we wanted it to, to appear. And then we decided that every time it will reflect the album that it sits in front, like it is the cover of. So the organic one was hand drawn. The one that was called the incredible machine. We made the same logo out of machine parts, right? So we, we kept the brand, but we changed it over time to give you any kind of idea what you were about to walk into. It's like changing the door of the house so that right before you go in, you get at least a hint. <laughs> yeah. So did I, did I hit, catch all your things, Ted or, or Kelly? Wow. Did... Yeah, it was amazing. That was amazing. Ted, okay. I need to add to that. Christian, thank you. That was, wow. Yes, you did. Thank you. Ted, did you want to add anything to that? Um, I just, from a brand perspective, what's really interesting about uh, that last little bit that he said is that you can, you know, if you're thinking about word of mouth, everything communicates. So, you know, there was a cover that Sugarland did for Billboard that said, you know, Sugarland is the best reggae country arena rock blah 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 band touring today because they had a particular album and so the reason that was oh great for sugarland is they were that's what they wanted to communicate so things that are physical communicate as well as just the story so what they would wear and what the logo was and that they would change the logo lots of times we get really obsessed about the logo always has to be the same so people know 
that assumes that everybody who you're selling to is stupid and cannot make a decision if I change it from this color red to that color red. So Sugarland said, everyone who loves Sugarland know it says Sugarland and we're gonna do something different. And that is talkable, at least to some people. And that is good because everything should be about more conversation and making it as easy as possible for people to have conversation so they could have the one thing, the one logo that was all of the mechanical pieces and people say, oh yeah, I like that album with the mechanical pieces all over it or the pipes or whatever that was. Right, make it easy for people to have a conversation and give them stuff to talk about and you will win. Wow, yeah, I love the fact that we have talked more about data in this conversation than many of the other conversations we've had. I'm thinking like, an, and it came from the, the musician in the room. Um, <laughs> like, I mean, the fact that you're using um, your intuition and then confirming it with the data and going back and forth between those two pieces of like, uh, of, you know, when people go to the bathroom uh, and that particular song, right, at a concert, that is fascinating, you know, measuring that data. Um, from a brand perspective, like you're managing it like a brand and each album is, a, is an offering and, um, and, and it's unique in itself and it can vary. Um, and that consistency is, yeah, over consistency is boredom, right? And it's too mass. Um, in your case, you're very specialty and, and, and don't need to be as mass for sure. Fascinating. Um, we don't have a tremendous amount of time, so I want to make sure I get in the question about what you, what you two are looking at as far as in 2021 or the next decade. We haven't been able to talk about the future because we've been so like looking down and horror as, as to what's happening in this particular year. Um, normally we'd right we'd be we'd be looking now like oh what's gonna what's 2020 gonna bring and we're all just like I just wanted to bring a little bit less talk about disease and politics please um, that would be nice um, but beyond that um, what are you seeing on the horizon? Let's start with you Ted what are you what are you looking forward to in 2021? So I'm definitely looking forward to a vaccine and then going to see some shows and going to bars and doing stuff that I love to do around other people. Um, I think I think for for all the marketers in the room and you know and Christian is and you know and everybody else. So I guess everybody. Um, I think what 2020 taught us in our shop was that once all the brands stopped and had a moment to think about things because everyone was working remote and so you had a little extra time. Um, broadcast, as far as North America is concerned, uh, it is not dead, but it is never gonna get more popular than it is now. I mean, people will still buy Super Bowl ads. I noticed that CBS still has lots of ads available. They've only sold out 70%, and that's, that's the public number that they're sharing was in ad age today. Broadcast has been supplanted in North America by conversation. And then so in 21, if you're trying to grow your business, it is conversation is really what's doing it. And, you, and you've seen over the last 20 years, it's very hard to actually name a brand. There's a couple, uh, Axe Body Spray definitely was a broadcast piece because um, that's a really bad, there's no way you can actually do that story. Like, hey, are you 14? you know, pay me $8 and spray this magic spray and models will fall from the ceiling and writhe upon you, right? So that needed to be, that story needed to be broadcast. But all of the other brands that are really hot right now, from Slack to Salesforce to Swell to Lululemon are, are the way they are because they have a fan base and they love to share that story. So that's, you know, Sugarland and the other bands that Christian has, has started or involved with, that's the direction they're going. He can speak to that. But for all my brand friends out there uh, and agency side people, conversation rules and everything else drools. And that is just the way forward. And either, either get on board or get out of business because that I mean, there, there's still room. You can still make TV ads for in the next little while, but it ain't too much longer until there really isn't going to be nearly the demand. Uh, there's going to be the same demand for that in 10 years as there are for newspaper ads right now. 
I mean, and that's, and that's just reality. We have changed, and that's digital, and that's in real life, that's face-to-face, -face, but it's conversation between two people and channel agnostic or omni-channel. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's what I'm seeing for 21. We will continue to see that. You've definitely seen that in 20. Yeah. You heard it here first. Thank Ted. That is very true. Okay. <laughs> Christian. Christian. Don't you just love how passionate this guy is? I know. I know. <laughs> oh, I mean, oh. like, I, I deal with people who like sing at 120 dB, like right here. He, he can do it with just his like sitting there. I know. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get him one of these soon where you just like hi. <laughs> how you doing? Barry White got the same amount done. <laughs> you know, ladies and uh, gentlemen, the Barry White of marketing. <laughs> exactly. Good lord. But uh, I think 21's uh, in my world is, uh, is significant. We have the everyone in our sector um, has is going to be playing for half as many people uh, for half as much money, um, mm -hmm. and is not going to recover fully for 28 months or something. Mm -hmm. We're not going to be back to where we were, and when we do get back. Um, that is a significant amount of time in the life of a band. A band is typically together for about eight years and then they break up. Mm. So this is an average lifespan. Sugarland obviously is like some sort of weird, like we, we, we somehow keep getting transfusions. Um, but I, I think that what I'm, I'm finding all the way around is I'm getting hired to do a lot more storytelling. Mm -hmm. mainly because of what Ted Wright's doing. You know, this kind of idea that everyone needs to learn to figure out what their story is or make one the hell up, you know, because it, it, it context is everything mm -hmm. when it comes to this stuff. I mean, we've seen it. Podcasts are now things we listen to because we like going into 2020, uh, part of what we were dealing with in the music business was everyone's attention span got smaller. Mm -hmm. Right. So we had, we had moved from, uh, from watching full videos online to first 30 seconds of videos before somebody skipped away. We decided we were going to go listen to metrics of when you scrolled past a certain thing, mm -hmm. you know, and if I could keep you there longer because the song's melody was better than whether it's radio or the, whatever the screen is in your hand, it, it was differently valued. And then we started to obsess on why do I not have seven seasons of this Netflix show? I only have six and now I'm pissed, <laughs> you know? And so your attention span must be available. You're lying. Um, and then I started to get hired to do musicals in the last three years. And I, I found I, that I don't know crap about musicals, but I know the one thing they don't do is A, give you songs that you remember, except the good ones. And then B, they tell stories. Mm -hmm. So how is it you're hiring a guy like me to continuously tell stories? So I think the attention span went into some sort of weird spiral into very, very short, very, very short, very, very short. And the truth is it's getting longer and longer and longer. Mm -hmm. And therefore your story has to not suck for longer and longer and longer. So I think that's where you, it, you you're going to value your storytellers coming up soon mm -hmm. a lot more than you did on the way in. And if you're willing to get on that treadmill or get up to pace with that, go find them, grab them, stick them in your world and learn everything you can. I'm doing it with storytellers around me. Like I'm sitting with novelists. I'm sitting with playwrights. I'm sitting with people who want to make entire albums, not just a single. Mm -hmm. And those, that value structure, I think is going to have a huge impact on, on my sector of the world. I love how that's counterintuitive, totally counterintuitive, but true. And the fact that we are, we're purging, we're, we're taking on all this content, we're consuming all this stuff. Our attention span's not getting shorter. It isn't. We're just getting more 
particular, right, about the things. We're skipping past a bunch of things and then going deep on one for a long period of time, right? We're just getting fussier because we've got a lot of stuff available to us. So we can be a little fussier as consumers. Uh, but we're not just skipping across a bunch of stuff. That's very insightful. It is indeed. Fascinating. Kelly, question? We're, we're at the top of the hour, but I, I'm going to put Christian on the spot. If he's willing, because I saw the guitar early on, can you give us a little ditty? Just something to, to close the hour would be magical. Please. Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> you guys are hilarious. Let's put it in tune. So here's your uh, product placement moment. <laughs> I don't take endorsements from instrument makers. And it's something that I learned from, uh, from other people uh, in the music business. And it's just, you, learn, you figure out your idols and then you just chase down what they do because you don't know how, there's no instruction book. And the only reason people give you instruments at all, because you dream of this when you're 15, man, one day they're gonna give me guitars. And it turns out they just want you to play them on television. Mm. And then you have to give them back. <laughs> right right and, that's cool <laughs> and so and yeah it's cruel and then uh and then the, and then you're like man oh i'm going out on tour is this enough and then the, they they bring you a guitar and you play it on tour and it's the worst version of their guitar right this is a company that uh called breed love and they at some point uh had decided in the 2000s that they were going to go try to get people to play their guitars and they just sent us the very best ones. So this one stays in Nashville ah. and it's, it's beautiful. Um, uh, it, I do this because I'm desperately always trying to get uh, more work because I'm anxious that somehow it's all going to disappear. Mm -hmm. This is a song that I've been trying to get Ted to play somewhere among his <laughs> wonderful people. And uh, it's a Christmas song because I'm obsessed with Christmas. Ooh, I, think, I, think, I think somebody's going to end up with this song. It's going to be a huge hit for their campaign. And then like seven years later, somebody else is going to cover it and I'm going to retire to an island. Okay. All right. All right. This is a very time of year. Any minute now, my relatives will all be here. Please, God, don't let me run out of beer. <laughs> I'm thinking bad drinking for Christmas. Filling my glass to the top with some holiday wishes. It doesn't matter what you're sipping it's the gift that keeps on giving just thinking about drinking for christmas there you go Love it. Love oh, it. God. oh my god that was amazing you heard that here first i'm guessing i i love yeah. that song it's gonna be oh my god it's so fun it's so fun. I'm glad you did that one, man. Thank you. That's hey, so fun. Thank you for having an artist on. I really appreciate it. Christian, thank uh, you. Thank, Ted, you. thank you. This was wonderful. We really appreciate thank it. Thank you. I'm very inspiring. Absolutely amazing. Entertaining. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you guys you. are great. Um, and thank you for putting this together. Everybody, thank you for coming and joining. Uh, this is a lot of fun. All right. Thank you, too. Thanks, everyone. This is great. See Bye, you. everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks.